Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul. Here to continue on the series of uh, Geography Now. I've been AFK or whatever, AOL, whatever it is, for a couple of weeks. And I want to go ahead and apologize for my speech. Uh, have my, you know, a lot of work done on my mouth, and uh, yeah, it kind of feels like I have a bunch of like mothballs or something stuffed in there. So I am sorry uh, if I'm slurring my words or they're coming out wrong. So I just want to go ahead and say that. But also want to say I have seen this, so but I, it's been like over a year. Like this is like a while ago before last time I seen it. Kind of forget, pretty much forget it. But obviously this is gonna rejuvenate my memory and all that stuff. Uh, so I, I want to get that out of the way because uh, I'm doing every single country in the world. And I, I didn't want to skip, you know, my own country, even though I've seen it. So maybe I just watched along with me and like, I know, just like remember cool stuff about our own country or like stuff that, you know, I forgot about or didn't even know about my own country. So, so yeah, let's go. Uh, get to it guys and before we do please hit that like and subscribe guys please and thank you and yes let's get to this video dun, dun. uh full screen please there you go here at Geography Now, we got over 40 people that emailed us to help out with this episode from Canada. So, without further ado, here comes the Canada episode. Woo! It's time to learn geography now! Hey, Geography peeps, I'm your host, Barbie. A lot of people sometimes have trouble distinguishing between Americans from the U.S. and Canadians. Here's a little analogy. Americans are kind of like teenage boys. They're opinionated, energetic, and confident, whereas Canadians are kind of like teenage girls. They'll be polite to you to your face, but then they'll talk crap behind your back. Come on. That being said, let's see if we can dissect the flag. The flag consists of a red field with a white square in the middle. In the middle of the entire flag lies a single 11-pointed red maple leaf. Red symbolizes the sacrifice during both world wars, and the white symbolizes the peace, tranquility, and neutrality of the country. The maple leaf has historically been a symbol of Canada for centuries, even during British rule. Some Canadians will tell you the 11 points symbolize the provinces, and the last one being for the territories, but eh, that's not really true. That's just kind of how the leaf looks. Yeah. Also, keep in mind, Quebec would much rather fly this flag instead of the maple leaf, but we'll discuss more about that in Okay. All right, so Canada is huge. It's the second largest country in the world, so it's pretty safe to say that you can bet that there's going to be a lot of interesting things when it comes to administrative divisions. First right. of all, Canada is located on the North American continent, right above the United States, bordered by three oceans, the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Pacific on all three sides. The country stretches over six time zones and is divided into ten provinces. Yes, hmm. people, Newfoundland and Labrador are together one province, and three territories in the north, the capital of Ottawa being in the province of Ontario. Yeah. Ooh, now let's have some fun. Now, the the thing is, Canada's domain is lavished with sovereignty enigma and semi-autonomous wonder. First of all, let's talk about the border. At over 8,800 kilometers or 5,500 miles, with thousands of markers along the way, Canada and the U.S. have the world's longest border between any two countries. Things are a little tame on the East Coast, except for that one island they have a dispute with Denmark over, and that one other island within kayaking distance that France refuses to let go of until you get to the... See, I never, like, growing up, I never knew about, you know, the Denmark island and the France island. I guess that's still a thing. I just think that's funny. It's hilarious. I feel like we're at war here, you know? To the Quebec Vermont border, and things get a little messed up when you reach Derby Line and Stansted. Since the town was built before modern day borders were properly established, the town has a variety of houses, businesses, yes. and buildings that lie directly crazy. on the border. Haskell Free Library even marks the border in its reading rooms and has an entrance for people on the US side and the Canada side. People of each country must enter on their side, and if they exit on the opposite country, they must stay on the sidewalk and report to the customs office. Failure to do so and stepping on the road can result in arrest. And this I would love to do just a YouTube video, go there and just play, hey, you know, back and forth, hi, I'm Canada, I'm in the U.S., and just, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there's already, like, a video like that out there, but, I don't know, I just think it'd be funny. You know, I'm sure a lot of people probably go there as tourists and have, like, one foot on one side, one foot on the other, hey, look, I'm in Canada and the U.S. You know, just how, like, a lot of people do that, like, with states, you know? I don't know. 
road can result in arrest. And this delightfully accidental slab of confusion known as the Northwest Angle that belongs to Minnesota, mostly owned by the Ojibwe tribe, situated on the Lake of the Woods, where you can find the reassuringly perfect getaway spots, Massacre Island, and Little Massacre Island. The rest of the border tries as best as it can to cut straight on the 49th parallel, even though it zigzags a little bit, and foreign Ooh. airports have runways that either straddle or are exactly parallel to the border. Somewhere around 80% of Canadians live within 100 miles or well, it'd be pretty easy, like, if you wanted to flee Canada to the U.S., or vice versa. So you could pretty much just go to these areas and just walk across, you know? I don't know if anyone in, uh, watching this video knows those areas, how simple it is, but how long that border is, it's probably pretty simple if you want to go to either country just to walk across. I wouldn't think there'd be too many people there to try and stop you. I don't know. Yeah, eight percent of the people do live on war, obviously. It's cold up there. By the way, I, I lived in Toronto, so or the outskirts of Toronto as I grew up. I agree. Canadians live within 100 miles or 160 kilometers to the border of the U.S., and the further north you go, things just get a little kind of fuzzy and neglected. They still have a little bit of trouble integrating the rest of the land the further up you go. There are only two main highways that lead to the Yukon and Northwest Territories from the south, whereas there are virtually no roads leading to any of the provinces or territories into none of it. The only way to get into none of it is to either fly or take a boat. I mean, technically you could walk across the border, but that would suck. Speaking of none of it, Canada has the most northerly inhabited place in the world. Alert Canada, a perpetually Alert. icy, frozen, desolate settlement typically operated by as few as five people year-round, functioning as both as a militaristic station and a seasonal research facility. Now, the one thing you have to know about Canada's administrative divisions is that it all kind of constitutionally fits together until you get to Quebec. Although Quebec is still considered a province of Canada, they've made it very clear in the past that they have a strong sense of Quebecois nationalism that many even take to this separate... That is very true, right? I was, a, I was a kid when this happened, but I think it was in the early 90s, uh, where there was a boat, I believe, uh, where they could, were going to maybe leave the country and become their own country. And obviously, you know, the boat failed. Obviously, more people there wanted to be, you know, state Canadian. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't even believe that it came to a point where they were voting to leave the country. It's kind of crazy. nationalism that many even take to the separatist extreme. Nonetheless, many of Canada's divisions and functions are heavily influenced by the landscape, such we will discuss in. Go Aflac! No commercials! Not your kid. The Aflac duck is just covering for Sophie. Same way you got me money to help cover her hospital. The ad block is back on. Get help with expenses health insurance doesn't cover. Get to know us at Aflac.com. <laughs> Okay, so once again, Canada is huge and often referred to as the Great White North. However, not all of Canada is a chilly Arctic tundra. First of all, Canada's physical features are built with a strange yet complementary mix of geological and meteorological... Yes, that's a word. Score! Meteorological facets. Looking at Canada, one of the most notable features that sticks out would have to probably be the Hudson Bay. The second largest bay in the world after the Bay of Bengal, and the largest bay that freezes over in winter. This bay provides a drainage basin that hydrates about half of the entire country and a little bit of the northwest of the I US. Didn't know that. The strange thing is that the <laughs> Hudson Bay actually sits on a gravitational anomaly in which gravity here is actually a little bit lower than the rest of the planet's average. It has to do with some kind of sciencey reason about ground convection and ice melt rebound, yada yada. Hey guys, want to lose some weight? Try the new workout and diet trend, Hudson 90X. <laughs> Our diet and workout plan includes going to the Hudson Bay. No, but seriously. See, you know, like, videos, I never knew this, this, like, this kind of stuff growing up. Like, they didn't teach this stuff. So it's cool, just even though I've seen this video before, it's like, definitely like, oh yeah, I remember this now. Uh, just that it's cool how these kind of videos. You learn stuff about your country that you would never even know. So I think it's cool. Even if you, you know, you're from a different country, watch your own country because, uh, yeah, you just learn something new. 
Almost it's nobody lives along the Hudson Bay. It's almost impossible to build roads with the rugged, splotchy rock landscape with too many ponds and lakes getting in the way for any straight highway to be built. Speaking of which, at around 2 to 3 million, it's actually speculated that around 60% of all the world's lakes and about 30% of all the world's fresh water can be found in Canada. Tap water can actually have better quality than bottled water in Canada. This has to do largely with the domineering, freckly crevice zone that takes up about half of the entire country, the Canadian Shield. The Canadian Ooh. Shield is a wide plateau of exposed Precambrian igneous rock that harbors little soil and vegetation but offers a glory field of mining. Canada has some of the world's richest deposits of metal ores like nickel, gold, silver, and copper. Two thirds of all the cesium in the world comes from one mine in Manitoba, Burnick Lake. Fun little side note Canada has the world's largest third order lake island. That's an island in a lake on an island in a lake on an island. Located on Victoria Island, this little squiggly four acre rock was discovered by map nerds who scrolled Google Maps just a couple of years ago. The island has no name and has most likely never had anyone step foot on it. I mean, I'll do it if nobody else will, but I might need a corporate sponsorship. I'm looking at you, Aunt Jemima. Yeah, like, dude took the time to, like, do this. So, like, someone must be extremely bored. Like, extremely. Or, I don't know. <laughs> That's just crazy. I'm looking at you, Aunt Jemima. Canada also has two of the top 10 largest impact craters on Earth. Sudbury Crater in Ontario and Manicouagan in Quebec with its almost perfectly circular imprint flooded and now a That's reservoir cool. that you can see from space. Okay, there's a lot more in this section, so I'm just gonna kind of rapid fire throughout all the rest of the facts. About 40% of the country is covered in forests and about one tenth of the world's forests are in Canada. Over 60% of the world's polar bears live in Canada. The Bay of Fundy has the world's highest tidal range with the highest point being over 16 meters. Niagara Falls looks cool. Mount Thor has the world's highest vertical drop. Quebec alone supplies about 70% of the world's maple syrup and they actually have a maple syrup reserve with over 222,000 barrels of maple syrup. Prince Edward Island has a weird natural phenomena in which the sands on the beach make this weird squeaking noise when you step on it. Here's some footage. Yeah, I've been to Prince Edward Island. I love PEI. And, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I never... I was young, though, so I never really, uh, never really tried this. I don't think it was on the right. I think it was like on like a rocky kind of beach. Or is that when I was in Halifax or Nova Scotia? I'm not sure. Anyways. The largest inland lakes besides the ones shared with the U.S. on the Great Lakes are the Great Bear and Great Slave Lakes, named after the slavey people. No, I'm not talking about slaves. I'm talking about the slavey people. There's a difference. One we'll discuss in... Uh... Canada is one of those places where everybody kind of fits in, but there's always a little bit of gossip going around every corner. First of all, Canada has about 35 million people, making it one of the least densely populated places on Earth, about three quarters of whom identify as white. Asians make up about 14%. Natives and Aboriginal peoples make up a surprising 5%. Blacks wow. at three, Latinos at two, and the rest are just kind of everything else. Now again, Canada's population takes another turn because in addition to ethnicity, Canada also has linguistic groups. About one out of every three Canadians either speaks French fluently or understands enough to get by. The whole Quebec thing kind of plays a paramount role in Canada's societal operations. They kind of have to work really hard to make sure that this one province cooperates. Also, keep in mind, Quebec isn't the only place in Canada where French is spoken. Communities in Ontario, Manitoba, and especially the Maritime Province, That's like true. New Finland, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, have huge communities of French speakers. The difference, though, is that these French speakers have an even deeper level of segregated culture. Many people in the Maritime Provinces have a unique Acadian French culture that oh. differs from Quebec. Fun side note, the Cajun people of the U.S. in Louisiana are generally descended yeah. from the Acadian people that were expelled and deported mm -hmm. from these provinces by the British in the 1700s. Back then, the Louisiana Purchase didn't happen yet, so all of this area was still French. Yada yada yada, they came over and invented gumbo. So that's why Cajuns speak French, America, because... Canada! Nonetheless, about <laughs> one out of every five Canadians was born outside of Canada, making Canada pretty diverse, especially by U.S. entertainment quota standards. All right, toss in a black guy, an Asian girl. Hey, why not throw in one of those Indian guys? Those people are trending these days. But make sure the lead is a handsome, attractive, rugged white guy. And this is where I want to make a Geography Now spotlight. Canada has a somewhat shrouded community of under-highlighted individuals that typically go unnoticed, even by Canadians. Sure, we can talk about Toronto, Vancouver. Heck, even Calgary has some chips on the table. But nobody really gives 
these guys a chance. So Yukon, Northwest, none of it, I'm putting you guys on display. Altogether, the population of all three of these territories is only about 110,000 people, making it the most sparsely populated area of all of Canada. First of all, indigenous peoples of Canada number about 850,000 and altogether have about 630 reservations speckled throughout the entire country. The largest reserves are located in these territories. Indigenous people in Canada are generally categorized into three separate groups. The First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit. The Métis are mixed race indigenous. The First Nations are generally southern tribes that typically live in forested areas, and the Inuit are straight up Arctic folk. Here's how you can kind of distinguish the three territories. Yukon is predominantly white. The Northwestern Territories has a lot of First Nation tribes, like the Slavey people who can be found close to the Great Slave Lake, although many of them prefer to be called the Dene. Cool side note, the Navajo tribe in the US to some extent trace their heritage to these people. See how everything is connected, people? Finally, we reach none of it, which is almost exclusively Inuit. The Northwest Territories and none of it actually used to be part of the same territory, but then in 1999, none of it exactly. was like, I ain't having none of it, and became its own thing. I'll, no, I'll but seriously, <laughs> Inuit culture is one of the most underrated and culturally fascinating things you'll ever encounter. They speak Inuktitut, a cousin of the Greenlandic language, they can pretty much understand each other, and they have their own written script that you can find on street signs and traffic posts. They have a long history of vibrant traditions, rituals, games, music, and even cuisine. If you ever come here, make sure you try some whale blubber and watch a throat game song which looks like this. <laughs> What a great way to make friends. That which takes us to... Canada is friends with everyone. The end. I, I, yes, I didn't hear ad in back. I had it. I don't know what happened. The end. Nah, okay. Let's elaborate uh, just a little bit more. Okay, so Canada does kind of typically maintain a foreign policy that does encourage diplomacy outreach to pretty much every country that they can grab at. Heck, they even had good ties with Cuba after the U.S. put an embargo on them. Nonetheless, Canada's relations kind of typically shadow those of the U.S. Allies with the same allies and opponents with the same opponents. I mean, have you seen the movie Argo? First of all, Canada is not only part of the Commonwealth, but the Commonwealth realm. Yes, there's a difference. So in general, they pretty much get along with everything that was once part of the British Empire. Then you get the Francophone countries that also gel well with Canada as well. The funny thing is, although the U.S. complains about the immigration procedures of Mexicans into the U.S., Canada is actually trying to coerce and entice Mexicans to come in. With its low birth rate and a need for a bigger workforce to assist the aging population, Canada has relaxed its immigration and visa policies in order to gain skilled workers, and specifically from the Central American regions. Flyers and advertisements are spread all over Mexico encouraging them to move in. Of course, when it comes to those closest to them, Canada does have their top pick. The United States. Some Ooh. say Canada is like the little brother of the U.S., some say it's like the best friend, but in all honesty, Canada and the U.S. are kind of like teenage high school sweethearts. Canadians and Americans have been there for each other since day one. The U.S. is the largest export and business partner of Canada and shares the closest diplomatic ties both nationalistically and militaristically. The difference between Canadians and Americans, though, is that Americans gain their independence by force, whereas Canadians by diplomacy. Yep. American immigration policy is like a melting pot where people are kind of expected to assimilate, whereas Canadian foreign policy is kind of like a mosaic. People are encouraged to be distinct culturally. In all honesty though, they are kind of like a cute little teenage boyfriend-girlfriend couple. Sometimes they like to poke fun at each other, but at the end of the day, they're totally dating and they're totally making out with each other in the back true, of the movie. True, true. In conclusion, Canada, you little sweet cheek you, I'll pick you up at seven. We're going out for some pancakes on that island, in a lake, on an island, in a lake, on an island. Stay tuned, Cape Verde is coming up next. Yeah, and can you ask her like, yeah. We could almost seem to go hand in hand, you know, probably talk shit about each other, <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, we have each other's backs, and yeah, and pretty much we all, we always, always get along, I mean, there's different views and stuff like that, but get over that, and uh, yeah, we're all friends, you know, I'm a Canadian, and I live in the U.S., and you know, my kids are American, so definitely know, you know, pretty much, you know, a lot, very similar, very similar. Uh, except for obvious, obvious differences, or obvious differences, but you know, we're all good people. Most of us. Anyways, uh, guys, thank you for watching. Please hit that like and subscribe. Uh, it's always cool learning more new stuff about your own country, and it was it was really cool to refresh my memory and go back over that video. And yeah, I will continue on every video uh, from Geography Now. Every country in the world. I'm going alphabetical order. Uh, so, you know, if you're, you know, I'm sorry if you're farther down the alphabet, but I will get to you. Um, yeah, 
out trying to get videos, you know, back going again. You know, I've been kind of, I've been out of it for a couple of weeks. But anyways, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. And yeah, I'll definitely catch you guys in future videos. Thank you for watching.